Welcome to this lecture on actor and network analysis. My name is Bert Enstrink and I will be your teacher on this subject. These colorful pictures behind me are maps representing social networks. One shows you the structure of a network of websites that refer to each other and the other shows us the pattern of sexual relations in a group of people. Nowadays, these maps are quite popular. For instance, on LinkedIn, you can create a map of your own social network and there are nice apps to make such a network map of all your friends at Facebook. Your Facebook map is for fun, but these are serious applications too. Knowing how these networks look like may be helpful in explaining, for instance, uh, why some websites are more successful than others or how a venereal disease spreads in a population. And the latter may help you to design a smart campaign to cap the spread of gonorrhea. These kind of maps just can be of interest for policy making. You might map who are involved in the offshore industry, who are influencing the European banking crisis, or to determine which persons are most influential in the various boards of supervisory directors. In this part of the course, we will learn what actor analysis is about, why you do it, and how you do it in a structured way. We will first discuss what actor networks analysis are and why we make them. Then I will walk you through the six steps needed to execute a full-blown actor network analysis. Now, when watching this lecture, consider yourself to be a young consultant who is going to apply this method for mapping and analyzing the network surrounding your case. Think about what you want to remember later. Make notes of what you think are the most important elements. We, people, are social animals. People and groups of people operate in networks. We relate to other people and to other groups because most of today's problems in society cannot be solved by a single person, by a single actor. They are too complex and in order to solve these problems we need to cooperate. We are interdependent. Governments, for instance, need private sector to implement effective policies and the private sector needs uh, the government uh, for regulating the markets which they are operating in. But often we are not aware of the networks we are operating in. The social fabric of the company or organization we are working in, the people inside and outside our organization, we need to get things done. But if you make these linkages and these dependencies explicit, you can use the power and the means of the people and the organizations in your network to get things done. And you can think about strategies to prevent that other uh, actors with different objectives obstruct your plans. So, knowing more about actors and the networks in which they operate helps you to improve the quality of your analysis, as you can tap on the wisdom of the crowds of other people and uh, exploit local knowledge. You can get better solutions, as uh, uh, talking to more people means getting more different ideas, different opinions. We gain insight in conflicts between parties and in opportunities and threats. And we may coin, gain support for the policy implementation as we learn who else wants the problem to be solved, who else has means we might use to solve it, and because engaged people feel responsible. And there's a normative argument too, as involving people in policy decisions affecting them is a matter of good governance, and these are democratic concerns. By now, we already use some terms that need better definition. Therefore, you should remember the following. Actors we define as social entities that have an interest in a system and or have some ability to influence the system. Actors are often groups and organizations, but also important individuals can be considered as actors. Networks are more or less stable patterns of social relations between actors. And in this course, we will focus on networks that take shape around policy problems or programs. So, oh, why actor analysis? I will show you one example to illustrate why actor analysis can be important. In this case, for the oil company Shell, who in the 90s of the past century wanted to dispose of an old oil rig or in fact a huge boy that had, to be, had been used for storing crude North Sea oil and which would be sunk into the deep sea 
as extensive studies had shown that deep sea disposal would be the most environmental friendly option. But Shell had not been very attentive to other actors who were opposed to this solution and were able to mobilize their network to support a very different solution. Yes, it's an old case, but it's a classical and clear example of a simple project going wrong for neglecting other actors in a policy game. Watch this one minute video and you'll see what happened. It's in Dutch, but the images are telling the message. So here it comes. In 1995 voerde Greenpeace actie omdat Shell probeerde het afgedankte olieplatform Brent Spar in zee te dumpen. Door de actie van Greenpeace kwam Shell onder grote druk van de publieke opinie te staan. Er volgde een langdurige bezetting van de Brent Spar, midden op zee door Greenpeace. Dit zorgde ervoor dat Shell uiteindelijk besloot het platform niet te dumpen, maar te ontmantelen en te recyclen. Dankzij deze actie werd voorkomen dat ook andere afgedankte olieplatforms in zee gedumpt zouden worden. So what happened? Well, the brand spore. SPAR was an oil storage buoy, a platform and a reservoir for holding crude oil for oil tankers prior to the construction of an oil pipeline connecting the oil field to the mainland. The brand SPAR was jointly owned by Shell Oil and Exxon, but Shell, Shell UK was responsible for the decommissioning. Preparations for decommissioning started in 1992. The brand SPAR was located in British territorial waters of a depth greater than 75 meters and weighted more than 14,500 tons. What to do with such a huge structure? Well, Shell commissioned no fewer than 30 separate studies to consider the technical safety, the environmental implications of disposal within uh, four possible, resulting in, in, in four possible options. One is disposal on land, second sinking the buoy at its current location, the third one decomposition of the buoy on the spot, or deep sea dumping in depth greater than 2,000 meters. After considering these options, with their risks and benefits, Shell concluded that only on-land disposal and sinking in the deep sea were viable. The other options were just as unfeasible or environmentally harmful. Deep sea dumping became Shell's, Shell's choice because of the relatively low cost and of the small environmental impact. It was the best and practical environmental option in the environmental impact assessment. On land was estimated to cost four times more and present a high risk for workers. So Shell got permission to dispose of the brand spa through deep sea sinking from the UK Department of Trade and Industry in December 1994. The decision was published and no other nation objected. So accordingly, the UK issued the disposal license authorizing uh, deep sea sinking of the Brent Spar. But before the disposal could be accomplished, Greenpeace activists and journalists occupied the Brent Spar on April 30, 1995. Shell security personnel and the Scottish police were dispatched to remove the protesters. That wasn't easy as Greenpeace activists attached themselves to the Brent Spar as you have seen in the movie. The media predominantly supported Greenpeace in its coverage. One shouldn't spoil our seas. Greenpeace activists were portrayed as heroes defending the environment, fighting Shell and the UK at sea. Greenpeace, with the support of other actors in the network, like nature conservation groups, mobilized an effective consumer boycott of Shell gasoline stations in Germany, Holland and parts of Scandinavia. In Germany, Shell gasoline sales declined by 20% and 50 gas stations were vandalized. Two were even firebombed by activists. Shell Germany and Shell Netherlands, feeling the pressure of this consumer boycott, publicly criticized Shell UK and the UK government and questioned the disposal decision. Even the German environmental and agricultural ministries <coughs> pro uh, protested to the UK government, claiming that the land disposal option had not been adequately investigated. 
The story continues. On June 16, 1995, the Brand Spa was again occupied by Greenpeace activists who boarded it from a helicopter as it was being readied for transport. A shell tugboat sprayed other Greenpeace activists with water as they attempted to board the Brand Spa from boats in an attempt to keep them away. Pictures of Greenpeace activists, like the ones in the movie, uh, braving the assault of water cannons adorned the front pages of newspapers throughout the world. At this point, Greenpeace made claims regarding their scientific analysis of the contents of the storage tanks on the Brent Spa, stating that there were large quantities of heavy metals and other highly toxic organic materials present and that Shell had failed to declare their analysis. On June 20, 1995, only hours before the scheduled disposal of Brent Spa, Shell announced that it was calling off the deep sea sinking option. Well, behind me you can see how the story ended. Shell towed off the spa to a Norwegian fjord. As an act of restoration and governance, it organized a design contest at the European University to think up a practical solution and for generation of social support. In the end, the walls of the buoy were used as quays in a Norwegian offshore harbor, and the claims by Greenpeace about the contamination and heavy metals inside the buoy proved to be false. An environmental and health impact of the online decommissioning was indeed considerable. What do you learn from this story? Well, one, uh, uh, communication is uh, uh, essential. You shouldn't ignore your opponents. And the mobilization power of parties can be very effective to change things. Maybe this all could have been prevented if Shell had paid due attention to the social environment it was operating in and had taken along the concerns of their opponents from the start of the process. And maybe if it had organized its decision process differently. But this all is hindsight. The general message is know your playing field. Beware of the concerns and issues of other actors and keep them in mind when you design your policies and try to create support for your plans and policies. Well, how to explore and map these social and political playing fields for policy making is exactly what we will learn to do in this part of the course.